is being recorded. All right, now I'll pass it over to our board president. Thank you. Good morning. Do I have Mr. Bodia? Are you here? Are we ready to start? Good morning, Madam President. I am here and ready to start. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the California Acupuncture Board meeting. My name is Dr. Amy Matecki. I'm the president of the board. Today is a Friday, June 25th, 2021. We present for the day two acupuncture board meeting. This meeting is being held via WebEx. This is an official business meeting of the acupuncture board. Pursuant to the provisions of Governor Newsom's Executive Order N-25-20, dated March 12, 2020, neither a public location nor teleconference locations are provided for this meeting. For all those wish to participate in this WebEx event meeting, please log on at the board website posted agenda on the day of this meeting. Since the meeting is conducted via WebEx, I will ask all board members and speakers to announce themselves by name before speaking for clarity of the official record. The board welcomes the public comments on any item on the agenda. It is the board's intent to ask for public comments prior to the board taking actions on any agenda item. Individual listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide a public comment and will be assisted by the DCA moderator who will be facilitating the teleconferencing process. The DCA moderator will explain the process for providing the public comments shortly. The meeting will be recorded. The time is now 9.32 a.m. Mr. David Brookman, could you please take a roll call to establish a quorum? I'd be happy to, Madam President. As I call your name, please let me know that you're here. Dr. Matecki. Present. Kitman Chan. Present. Yongping Chen. Present. John Harabedian. Here. Francisco Kim. I'm here. Thank you. Xu Dong Li. Present. Ruben Astorio. A member Astorio, um, we're still showing you as muted. Are you with us, Mr. Osorio? I can try to call him. Give me one second. <clears throat> Ruben is saying that he's here, he can hear you, but for whatever reason, he can't unmute himself. We've okay. had this issue in the past. Um, this is so true. he is here. Um, this is the moderator. Let me go ahead and um, try manually unmuting him and see if that helps. They're going to try to manual and mute. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. I'm here. Yes, we can hear you now, Mr. Osorio. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Um, Madam President, I show that all board members are here. We have seven members present and we have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Brugman. So we will now move on to agenda item number 18. Uh, I really don't have much to add. It. You can refer my remarks from yesterday. But I just want to reiterate it, reiterate it as we move forward. Please keep in mind the board is upholding its highest priority of public protection. We will now move on to agenda number item number 19, public comment on items not on the agenda. Please limit your comments to three minutes. So, DCA moderator, would you please help to facilitate? 
This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment for items not on the agenda, please click that Q&A icon at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. We're currently sharing instructions on the screen for your reference and we'll share these instructions each time we open up for public comment. Um, and typically in the ask field uh, at the lower right hand corner of your WebEx screen, please type, I would like to make a public comment and send to all panelists. I'll now pause a moment to give the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, this is the moderator and it appears there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. All right, the Q&A panel is now closed. Thank you. So we will now move on to agenda item number 20, review the consumer protection role of the board. Our legal counsel, Mr. Chen Yu, please. Um, good morning, uh, board members, Madam President. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to briefly review the board's consumer protection mission. The acupuncture board was created as a regulatory body to regulate licensed acupuncturists. Its primary mission is to protect the consumers of California. Now, that mission is fulfilled in the following ways. One, determining whether someone meets the statutory minimum requirements. Um, two, disciplining licensees who violate the board's practice act and regulations. Three, pass relevant regulations related to the board's practice act. Four, prevent unlicensed activity. In other words, the board's consumer protection mission or protection rule is mainly an, an administrative one where it grants and disciplines licenses. Unless the le legislature specifically grants the board such powers, the board's mission does not encompass regulating medical or acupuncture related products, how much licensees or providers can charge for their work, ensuring the economic viability of the practice of acupuncture in and outside of the state, promoting the practice of acupuncture in or outside of the state, protecting the business interests of acupuncture-related industries, protecting the financial interests of consumers employing licensed acupuncturists, or other issues better addressed by trade associations. It is also important to remember that the board can only enforce matters that are listed in its practice act or regulation. The board's consumer protection mission does not permit the board to regulate matters that are outside of its practice act, even though the matter at hand may have some direct or indirect bearing on consumers. Also, the board's regulations are restricted within the confines of the board's practice act, and the board cannot pass regulations that expand those laws or fail to clarify them. Those individuals who desire the board to discuss and take actions on issues outside of the board's practice act are welcome to petition their elected officials to amend the existing statute governing the practice of acupuncture and to, great, and to grant greater responsibilities and power to the board. However, until the legislature make the relevant amendments, the board legally cannot take action on such matters. Uh, from my experience with this board, um, and just from discussion um, you know, during these board meetings, um, this board is extremely conscientious of, protection, of protecting the consumer on and ensuring that uh, you know the licensees, the licensed acupuncturists, um, have the uh, minimum required uh, you know skills and knowledge to perform their job, and for that, I commend the board for its actions. And this uh, this is uh, you know this is the end of my uh, of my review. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chang Yu. Um, I would like to open up to our board members. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, comments, discussions, please feel free. You know to open up now. It's a great chance for us uh, to, um, especially uh, anyone. Uh, I'm on the board for the last the five years. There's so much learning, uh, understanding how the board functions. So. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chang Yu, um, for your clarification. Let's open up to our board member. 
Hi, Dr. Mateki. I had a quick question for counsel. Sure. Um, the hair painting. No problem. Thank you. I, I just had a quick question. Was there something that was brought to the board or to a member that brought up this uh, this necessity to review this, or can we just get a little bit of background as to why we're, we covered this? Uh, of course. I mean, I believe that the last previous meetings there were uh, uh, several questions as to what uh, the board uh, scope was as to as far as what actions it could take um, and what uh, you know what constitutes the board's uh, consumer protection mission. So I thought that you know maybe this was a good opportunity to just do a general review of what that mission is and what it encompasses. And to further add uh, clarity to your question, Member Harbigan, this is Ben Bodia. Um, this, uh, in the last year, especially with the herbal task force requests that uh, kept coming up at our meetings, or some stakeholders asking us to change fees that were set in statute, uh, we wanted to just underline the board's authority in being able to establish laws only through regulation and only to that are fitting within the statute as provided in the Practice Act. So this is uh, an attempt to um, allow for the education of the public as well as uh, the board. Uh, it wasn't targeted just to board members. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herbiding. Any questions from or comments from other board members? This is uh, Member Kim. I, uh, like yesterday, uh, I wanted to discuss some of the uh, curriculum review uh, because uh, you know a lot of uh, healthcare uh, environment and the regulations been changed, so we need to uh, input those uh, I mean uh, those changes into the uh, the curriculum uh, review as a consideration for those. Uh, to protect the public for those uh, uh, providers uh, to be aware, you know, new new uh, regulations and new new environment things. So uh, that's what I I raised uh, uh, and proposed uh, uh, agenda for next board meeting. So is is this this something that? Uh, uh, that fits into the uh, board's uh, role as a as a consumer protection? Um, I believe so because the board has been given um, the power by the legislature uh, to deal with the school's curriculum. So because it's in statute, um, therefore the board, well, it's in your practice act, therefore the board would have, uh, you know, the power. It's, it will be within the scope of the board's uh, responsibilities to tackle those issues. Thank you. Thank you, Member Kim. This is a great question. Any other board members have any comment or questions? Here now. Okay, so I would like to open up to the public for comments. So DCA moderator, would you please facilitate? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this agenda item, please click that Q&A icon at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. Go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. This is the moderator. Seeing no requests for public comment, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. All right. The Q&A panel is now closed. Thank you. Now let's move on to agenda item number 21, 
review of the board's role concerning request for public comments. So our legal counsel, Mr. Fred Chang Yu, please. Thank you, Madam President. Um, so I'll be going review, I'll be reviewing briefly the aspects of public comments and the Open Meeting Act. One of the main purposes of the Open Meeting Act is to allow the, the public to provide comments and input to a board when it is in the process of making a decision. The reasons are twofold. First, it gives the public a chance to comment and to provide input on the board's decision-making process. Second, it gives the board an additional source of information to draw from when it is deliberating on a particular issue. The authors of the Open Meeting Act recognize that board meetings and their staff do not always possess all pertinent information and perspectives on all issues within the board's jurisdiction, especially what effects and consequences a decision may have on the public at large. The ability of the public to provide comments and input gives the board different perspectives to consider in its deliberation. Therefore, the public's ability to provide comments is a critical component to the board's decision-making process. However, there are certain limitations to the public's ability to comment on issues on the board's agenda. First, members of the public do not have a right to engage in disruptive speech and behavior. The public has a First Amendment right to state their views, whether positive or negative, regarding a board's position or views or to comment about the board's performance in general. A board cannot prevent a speaker from criticizing its performance or position. However, this does not mean that someone from the public can use offensive language or behavior when addressing the board during the meeting. A board has a right to ask the speaker to refrain from using offensive language or continuing their uh, or refrain from continuing their disruptive behavior. Now, from my experience so far, um, members of the public have been extremely good in their public comments, and I never had uh, witnessed such a problem. All right, second, a board has the right to set reasonable time limits for each speaker from the public to make their input and comment. Giving unlimited amounts of time for members of the public to speak on an issue may prevent a board from being able to conduct and finish its meeting. The Open Meeting Act does not prescribe a certain amount of time per comment. However, it has to be long enough for a speaker to be able to make their comment. From experience, I have seen time allotment anywhere from two minutes to five minutes per speaker. In addition, in situations where there's a large number of speakers and the majority of them want to provide similar comment or input on a given issue, a board has the right to ask members of the public to not repeat the same comments after a reasonable amount of speakers have already, have already delivered the commonly held view or statement. Allowing everyone to repeat the same comment will prevent other items on the agenda from being considered and would not provide the board with additional input or information in its deliberation. Third, the Open Meeting Act only provides the public with an opportunity to, opportunity to provide input and its views during board deliberations. The Open Meeting Act does not require a board to engage in a back and forth discussion or debate with the public, nor does the act require a board to answer questions from the public or to provide legal advice, analysis, or explanation on any given issue. I want to emphasize that the Open Meeting Act does not prevent a board from answering questions uh, from the public if it so chooses, but a board is not legally required to do so. In closing, public comments is a critical and important part of the board's decision-making process. From my experience, this board does take comment from the public seriously and is willing to listen to their input and has provided um, you know, reasonable opportunities for the public uh, to state their views. I commend the board uh, for such actions and encourage the board to continue to continuing doing so. And that is the end of my um, of my review. Thank you very much, Mr. Chen Yu. So now I'm open up to our public. Um, uh, open up to our members, board members. If you have any questions, I think this is a great review. Uh, because sometimes as a board president and um, when we have the open meeting here, uh, some of the public comments, you know, we were kind of like, okay, um, should I, you know, step in to answer? But I understand, you know, the representation at a large. Uh, so some of the questions, um, 
uh, maybe not at that moment, uh, you know, to give the answer. Um, so that uh, is a great uh, information for me uh, also. Um, okay, let's see, board members, uh, please, um, you know, chime in if you have any questions or comments for our legal counsel. Thank you for clarification. This is a uh, member Kim of uh, this uh, uh, public meetings uh, and uh, uh, board, board's uh, uh, role as a, as a uh, consumer protection agency. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I will keep that in mind. Okay. Thank you, member Kim. Any other board members? This is Yong Ping Chen. May I speak? Yes, Dr. Chen, please. So, for uh, what I uh, what I see our board, I think uh, um, we're pretty open to the public for uh, comments, and the public uh, were, uh, were able to express their view and their comments. Um, and the board president and EO um, and the moder moderator uh, make the meeting smooth. So, so far, I don't see uh, any problem. Uh, and the public comments, uh, like uh, Mr. Chen Yu said, uh, so far we don't see anybody uh, use uh, the language. Uh, not fit for the meeting atmosphere. So that's my comments. Thank you. Thank yeah, you, just, Dr. Chen. Oh, this is a um, this is Fred Chen. You, um, yeah, I just want to uh, uh, I want to second that comment. Uh, just from my experience, the public has been very courteous in its uh, very respectful in, in their comments to the board, even though they may not necessarily agree with the board position. Or agree with what's being uh, being said. So I do wanna I do want to emphasize that point. Thank you, Ligo. Thank you, Dr. Chen. This is Executive Officer Ben Bodia. Um, this uh, request uh, to underscore what's been said already was just to uh, inform the public and the board on the communications and the expectations in the communication as the meeting proceeds. Um, as noted that. The, these meetings aren't to facilitate back and forth discussions in the board meetings. However, the board does have the option to ask some questions of the public comments should it choose to do so. Uh, but uh, there were a number of comments in the last few meetings uh, from some public mem uh, from some members of the public um, saying, asking like, why aren't you answering my questions? So I guess my question is not going to be answered. So this is just to make the expectations clear with all of our stakeholders and members. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bodia. Any other board member comments? Hearing none. So I would like to open up to the public comments. ECA moderator, could you please facilitate the public comment? Thank you. This, this is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Uh, members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests.
All right, this is a moderator. It looks like we do have one uh, individual who's requested public comment, individual identified as Michael Fox. Michael, you'll be given three minutes to speak in a 30 second warning. I am unmuting your microphone now. Hello, this is Dr. Michael Fox, and often I have trouble with my microphone, so I just want to verify if you could that you can hear me. Is that is correct? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. I really have a brief question. You, you mentioned several times that um, these board meetings are not a forum for back and forth discussions. Much of that falls to our trade associations and our stakeholder groups. Is there, um, I realize I'm asking a question, but is there a forum where there might be a possibility of back and forth discussions with the acupuncture board by the stakeholders, and that's really all I have. Thank you. This is the moderator. Um, it appears there are no further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. All right, the Q&A panel is now closed. So this is a testing now. <laughs> Legal, Mr. Chang Yu. So, uh, would you like, you know, to uh, have any comment or answers? Madam President, I can step in here. Uh, the yes, members please. of the public are welcome to send inquiries to the board. Uh, board staff can provide the. Uh, regulations and the statutes that apply to their questions. Board staff are not allowed to give legal advice, but we have met with stakeholders, uh, individual stakeholders, as well as groups of stakeholders um, to address their questions uh, and provide the guidance as much as it is within our authority. Um, perhaps uh, the distinction here is that it's like the board is making the decisions, the staff are facilitating the work. So if there's any questions from our stakeholders, it should be coming into the staff and arranging for that. Again, we cannot provide legal advice. We can definitely cite the law. So um, it's it, there's definitely abilities to communicate with the board. We're constantly answering questions every day. We have email, fax questions still um, that we respond to, and it's our priority to respond to. We have a triage unit uh, set up uh, for these kinds of communications coming in that deliver any kind of more specialized questions to the various desks that uh, cover specific domains. So we invite the questions to come in. We invite our stakeholders to know our laws and regulations. Uh, we have them posted on our website. Um, and we invite questions that might be a bit more specific, but at the same time, um, we would like people to know that we cannot give legal advice as sometimes all we can do is point to the laws, but we are here to help and as much as we can within our authority. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bodia, for the clarification. Any other board members like to have any comments after this? Okay. So, if hearing now. Okay. Now let's move on to agenda item number 22. Presentation on CEU requirements for acupuncture board and other healing arts boards in the Department of Consumer Affairs. Mr. Bodia, please. Thank you, Madam President. And I will go ahead and defer to our policy coordinator, Christine Brothers, who worked on this memo. And she will provide the highlights from each of the uh, healing arts boards that we looked into, uh, and then allow for the board to discuss or offer any questions. Please, Ms. Brothers. Thank you, Ben. So just getting into the report, we did do a comparison of seven different healing arts boards um, to the acupuncture board, and those were uh, Board of Chiropractic Examiners, Medical Board, Osteopathic Medical Board, Naturopathic Medicine Committee, Physical Therapy Board, Physician Assistant Board, and the Board of Registered Nursing. And so um, we just looked at all of the 
um, major continuing education requirements and um, after the, the summaries of each, um, you'll find the um, source laws and regulations and uh, where we uh, found that information. So this is just for the purposes of reviewing um, each of the CE requirements and kind of providing a, a comparison um, that will provide a perspective on where the acupuncture board's requirements, where we parallel and where we differ uh, with these other boards. So if you look at the chart, um, there were kind of four different major CE requirement areas that were compared and um, between the different license types. And so most of the license types are, uh, the renewal period is uh, biennial. Um, you can see there that chiropractors have an annual renewal and so they have to do 24 hours of continuing education each year. So it comes um, pretty close to the 50 CEUs for acupuncturists and MDs, um, as well as uh, physician assistants. And then you'll see that um, physical therapists are 30, as well as um, natural, <laughs> sorry, nat nurse practitioners. Um, and then we have um, 60 hours for naturopathic doctors and 100 hours for um, osteopathic doctors. Um, each uh, license type does have to retain their uh, certificates from their continued education uh, for a number of years, the majority being four years. Um, that you'll see across the boards. Um, and I do see that uh, naturopaths do have to re um, retain it for six years and physical therapists for five years. And then we also see uh, differences for the initial licensee renewal requirement. Um, we have a prorated schedule for acupuncturists um, and so does um, osteopaths. And then you'll see that a couple of license types actually waive um, continue, continue education for the initial license period. Um, and then medical doctors, if they've been licensed under 13 months, they just have to do half of their CEUs. And then physical therapists, again, they just have to do half of their total CEUs. Um, I didn't find information for phys uh, physician assistants that look like they didn't have any different requirements for their initial licensee renewal requirement. Um, so, I mean, those are the ma major four areas. We do summarize additional um, CE requirements of each board and license type, um, and that's laid out in the memo. Um, I wasn't going to go over each one, but um, if anybody has any questions, um, I'm, you know, I'd be happy to answer. Um, and that's basically it, just kind of a comparison there where we stand up against those other boards. Thank you, Ms. Brothers. So um, I'm not sure this is appropriate, but I do have a question here because sometimes I get asked uh, by the licensees. You know, in the hospital, I, I know there is a, you know, integration. Uh, there is a many uh, licensed acupuncturists uh, start working uh, in the Western medicine facility, all hospitals. And in the hospital on the daily, uh, there's always uh, lectures, grand rounds, uh, a lot of great information uh, uh, for providers for practitioners. You know, I, I know this is maybe involved with the future, uh, um, you know, apply for changing through the uh, legal ramification, but I'm just wondered with the CE requirement, or maybe this is under the board uh, supervision, is, a, is it a, you know, board look into, could use the continued med medical education uh, from the medical board side, um, you know, for the 50 units, what do we have it here? Um, 
is it a possible like uh, four units, five units? I am not sure, you know, how the decision will be making, but it could a possibility add, um, you know, the Western medicine learning. Hope my question is not too long. Maybe Mr. Bodia and other board members, if you guys want to chime in. Thank you. Certainly, Madam President. Um, yes, the continuing education requirements is within the board's authority. Is established with in, in terms of what to take. It is established in regulations, and uh, the board could look at uh, accepting continuing medical education credits uh, that are approved by the medical board should it choose to do so, uh, as well as perhaps uh, those approved by other licenses, license types, or regulatory bodies. Uh, Mr. Hurt, did you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I was going to mention that. And the other thing is, is that um, those units could be included now if they were applied for, uh, you know, by a uh, board approved provider and the course is approved. So um, those courses, the content are would be able to be approved, but they have to be offered by a, a board uh, recognized provider. Thank you, Mr. And that is uh, true. We, we do see some um, chiropractic uh, um, practitioners that are um, offering coursework in um, stretching, exercise therapy, um, that kind of thing. So there is crossover, but these providers have signed up directly with the board to offer their courses. Uh, and then just to underscore Mr. Hertz, um, anybody, uh, any uh, continuing education provider from other domains can apply and see if their courses would work with acupuncture. So there's nothing stopping them from applying now, but in terms of if the board is looking to provide a um, wider approval of just saying we accept CMEs or a certain number of CMEs uh, being the uh, physician continuing education, uh, then that would be within the board's purview. And uh, Mr. Chan, you please correct me if I'm wrong. I wanted to add on that um, it may be something that we could, you know, seek in the future if the if um, there is a desire for that. Um, Board of Chiropractic Examiners, they, if you look at the last bullet, they do allow licensees to take um, some coursework from uh, other Division II Healing Arts Board and Bureau approved courses. Um, and then also um, Board of Registered Nursing, they're, the last bullet there, um, they do the same. They would allow and accept courses that are um, taken from other licensing boards, approved from other licensing boards. We don't currently have the authority to do that um, because an, a, a provider has to separately apply for specific board approval, but um, we would have to um, change our regulations to allow for something like that. Thank you, Ms. Brothers. So then um, now the question to Mr. Bodia. So if the board uh, would uh, like to look into it, um, maybe the process will from the Education Research Committee or uh, that could be a possibility. We don't have to go through the legal ramification, correct? Yes, there's nothing stopping the board from looking into this. Um, and as we see some regulations that allow for that, um, I would be hesitant to just do a, you can do as many units from any other healing arts board or bureau, um, only because as we just uh, have been discussing in the last year, um, we've, our continuing education approval process has changed where each course has to be approved. Uh, so the enforcement of that will be more um, incumbent upon those uh, regulatory agencies that did the approval of that coursework. And we can definitely refer our complaints to that uh, program, um, but it will open it up. So having all units would be more challenging, uh, acceptable from other Division II Healing Arts boards, but uh, allowing a certain amount um, is definitely feasible. Thank you. Thank you for the clar clarification. I don't have any further question. 
Any other board members have any comments or questions? Yeah, I, I, I want to make a comment. Uh, this is member Kim and I see the, the required uh, continuing education hours, all these from uh, different uh, healthcare uh, professions. And I see that DO uh, biannually, they require nine of all uh, those other health professions. So member Kim, I think we lost you for a second, or maybe just on my side. Um, well, I, I think uh, you know, maybe it's because they, they need to share <coughs> more uh, of those uh, other knowledges and uh, or, uh, training. Because I, I, I've been uh, a uh, preceptor for uh, DO students, for this uh, DO medical students uh, uh, in, in Vallejo. And I see, I've been there several times for conferences and all that, but I see the, the MD has, medical schools have their own facilities, everything there, including the hospital. But the uh, DO don't have it. So I think that's why they, so in this uh, prospect of uh, few, I think uh, the, the uh, licensed acupuncture uh, program has to be in, you know, in, in looking into uh, the standard of those uh, uh, other uh, clinical uh, knowledge and skills uh, more than uh, than other, uh, you know, acupuncture theories and, and principles, which was already learned in school. So, uh, you know, we can talk about this in, in the uh, research and uh, education and research committee, but this is uh, something that we can look into because now uh, a lot of practitioners they are being challenged by a lot of other uh, requests from their, I think, uh, clients and other, even other uh, healthcare professions as a, as a referral or other uh, uh, request from directly from the uh, patients, and which they don't learn from their, their school years. So maybe that's something that we have to discuss about the standard of education. Because uh, I've been I've been practicing uh, almost 17 years, uh, or, or more than 17, and I now I realize uh, the the program that I went through in the acupuncture program is nothing much than the uh, trading trade school, like uh, technical you know college. Why? Because I learned a lot of uh, acupuncture theories and you know TCM principles and uh, all that, but in in the clinical science, I had to go through a separate uh, education process, like going into the college, get acquire or, or other uh, knowledges from other seminars and all these things. So maybe maybe we had we should talk about the uh, CE requirements or certain uh, uh, subjects that's been um, demanding, demanded, being demanded by the public and other uh, healthcare profession. That's my comment. Thank you, Member Kim. I see Dr. Chang, your hands is up, please. Dr. Chen, Kim Ping Chen. Thank you, Dr. Mataki. Uh, I echo your view uh, for uh, the necessity for the acupuncturist to get uh, some not the knowledge uh, from other uh, from medical uh, board approved the CU. Um, 
of course, uh, uh, if they can also apply uh, acupuncture board to see you, like uh, Mr. Bodia said, uh, that will not have a problem, right? But um, usually, they probably will not uh, apply for acupuncture board see you. Mean meantime, uh, because cost the money, um, but uh, I see the um, there's needs uh, for some acupuncturists to learn from um, to learn the CU to take the courses from other healing arts um, board approved CU. So I saw um, in acupuncture board um, CE requirement. Uh, maximum of five hours in a two-year period on C content unrelated to clinical matters or the provision of health care to patients. Um, is it possible? Could, I mean, I suggest, could we add it on uh, under that sentence, say, or uh, the CEO from other board approval, other healing arts board approval. So five hours uh, without the acupuncture board approval, but other board approval. Is that possible? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Well, I, uh, before maybe uh, Mr. Bodia or maybe Mr. Hurt or anyone want to help answer the question, but I just want to follow with what Dr. Cheng said. Uh, that's actually raised a good, uh, you know, question for me because on this side, I see um, currently, I believe the, you know, acupuncture uh, has done a great job of promote, you know, the profession. Uh, many of the physicians on the side uh, currently really like to uh, refer patients, or I do know there are, uh, you know, quite a few physicians interested uh, to practice acupuncture themselves. Uh, but I do know, like I work with my uh, physicians over here, she loved to take the acupuncture uh, class uh, was hosted by acupuncture associations, and she felt like she really learned a lot. Maybe in the future, we, you know, can work with a medical board also, as we take five of their CME, they can take ours, maybe five units of a CEUs, or something, you know, I don't know that's possible, but I'm just thinking from the uh, patient public protection side, um, it would be really mutual benefit uh, for both the board. Um, our hospital required physician have to, you know, have the 300 unit, uh, 300 hours of training uh, in medical acupuncture. So, you know, I want to just uh, say this is a maybe the future dialogue uh, that ultimately is the board um, put, you know, public protection uh, and also, you know, benefit for the licensees, uh, cross uh, interactive uh, with other uh, healing uh, uh, healthcare system. So I will stop here and uh, thank you, Dr. Chen, for what you said. Um, I see Mr. Hurd, your hands is raised. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mataki. Um, and I just wanted to say that um, what I see working here is that the CME, the medical uh, um, continuing educations, is often accepted sort of across many, many, many healings arts boards. But I think you also bring up a really, really good point is that there's very big overlap between, I mean, there's many, many physicians practicing acupuncture in California. So some kind of work with a medical board is something that, that I've seen working here. So, um, you know, I, I just think that that's something to capture. And I think it's great that you guys are um, speaking about that because it's, it's something we see here at the board. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Dr. Mateki, I had a quick question, and um, it's yes. really just about how the acupuncture board, we allow for a maximum of 50% of the total required CE to be done through independent or home study. And I, um, you know, the summary doesn't seem to note that other similar boards allow that. Maybe they do, 
but they're just, uh, you know, it's just not really noted. Are we at all concerned about that, that somehow we're different and that we allow for the independent home study, whereas these other boards don't? I would, you know, I, I would be interested to hear the, the views of the practitioners on that too, and, and the staff. So, Mr. Herbeating, I just want to uh, have a clarification. You mean it's like a hand-on training or versus a distance learning, or am I? Yeah, so... it's a good, no, I think that's a good question. I don't know, because it's the last bullet point on page one under acupuncture board. We say that there's a maximum of 50% of total required CE in a two-year period can be done through independent or home study. and um i just look i mean the other boards don't really have something similar i don't think but i may be wrong it just may not be included here and so um that was the one thing that i agree with everything you all have said about overlapping and kind of intertwining our training with other boards and and medical services i think that's a great idea this is you know this is a different point about whether the ce requirements for us are a little bit more lax, if you will, in the uh, independent and home study realm. I don't really know, to your point, Dr. Mateki, what independent and home study means, though. So maybe we can clarify that. Yeah, I echo with uh, uh, John, member Kim. Uh, I just also uh, noticed that the chiropractic board also they say like licensees shall take a minimum of 18 hours of CE uh, in 16 approved uh, subject areas uh, approved by the California Department of Industrial Relations, which is the I mean the Division of Workers' Compensation or other other healing arts uh, board. So that means uh, they they specifically uh, request require those uh, CE categories into uh, whatever they, they've been uh, focusing on uh, and to uh, the, those practitioners are, are doing, not just the general you know, like, uh, home study or distance learning uh, uh, topics they, they, they choose to. So I think uh, it's, uh, it's an important point that we should look into. Thank you, Member Kim. And thank you, Mr. Harbidin, the great questions. Uh, I echoed on that too, is uh, for me, I look at acupuncture, uh, the skills, um, you know, the hand-on training and experience. Um, so think about it myself, if I'm going to a provider, practitioner who learned everything distantly uh, online, or now I come in in person if they're going to needle me. Uh, I would be very hesitant, you know, to thinking the provider learned all the skills through online. Um, so I, <laughs> maybe Mr. Bodia and Mr. Hurt uh, and maybe Lego, you guys can see, looks like uh, there is a lot of work on the uh, continued education side. Um, maybe the next step uh, for the education committee uh, can start a work on that. So, Mr. Bodia or Mr. Hurt, would you like to help answer the board members have the questions here? Yeah, Amy, I can say one thing. Um, I think it's a great idea for us to get some specific work. Um, I, I can verify that the med board does allow some level of distance education, um, but I'd like to do, you know, have our unit do some more research on that. But I think it is, is a great question to, to tease out what's allowed as distance, particularly for practice of medicine on people, which is a very much of a... Um, apprenticeship model where you're working with the patients with the person who's teaching you it's it's often a live sort of you know transmission of knowledge you know and and capture of what's happened so um yeah i i think it's a great idea to, to have staff do additional research here thank you thank you so we don't need to vote on that and uh mr bodia you can just uh, direct your staff to work on that correct certainly madam president Thank you. You have you wanted to add anything here? Uh, just that there is some uh, distance education allowed for other programs. Uh, I also wanted to point out that a number of the programs that we reviewed here actually do allow 
um, their licensees to earn up to four hours of continuing education for attending board meetings. Now they would have to sign uh, the um, visitor uh, acknowledgement or have their name captured on uh, the attendance uh, list in some fashion, but uh, that does allow for um, another way to participate. Uh, definitely not related to the continuing medical education. Uh, in terms of uh, distinguishing between a live in-person courses and distance education courses, that would be, uh, that's part of our um, goal to refine the CE regulations. Um, and so when we're moving through that, we can definitely take a look at these additional areas. Uh, as we see, some of the programs are quite specific about the other areas that are um, other modalities or licensed scope areas that are, are acceptable. Um, and uh, a number of them do limit it. So um, as Dr. Chen inquired, um, yes, we could uh, easily allow for an if the board chose to pursue this regulation, five units uh, from whatever board they specified uh, allows for that or whatever approving. Uh, in, in in some of our healing arts professions, the professional association on a national level uh, manages the approval of their continuing education. Uh, so uh, they usually defer to those uh, to allow for that as well. So. Um, yeah, we definitely have options, and I would be happy to dive into this further with staff. Great. Thank you. Great discussion. Member Cam, do you have anything to add? It looks like. Yes. Yeah, he just mentioned that the other, uh, some other healthcare professions are, are uh, also uh, associations uh, handled by this uh, uh, CE. Uh, the uh, uh, oversight or, or uh, approval. Uh, I just found that the, uh, the DO, Osteopathic Medical Board, uh, they are, they, if the CME accepted for credit may be from program certified by AOA, which means uh, uh, I think it's American Osteopathic Association and uh, associate AOA specialty groups and board approved organizations and institutions. So, you know, I, it's been a uh, very, I, I've been, it's been an issue that uh, the board uh, has to uh, audit all these uh, CAC providers. But uh, if uh, we're uh, working with the associations and specialty groups or, or the board approved organizations uh, handle or, or endorse some of those uh, providers, and we can prevent uh, uh, any any uh, you know, uh, low quality, poor quality uh, C uh, uh, providers uh, doing their their CEU uh, courses in their own on their own, and um, maybe we can prevent that, and also it'll uh, increase the benefit of uh, those uh, public the consumers. Uh, Who's, who's getting a treatment from them? Maybe uh, it, it'll it'll enforce them to uh, to learn something that's essential for for the, for the treatment, uh, rather than something that in their own interest uh, area, interested area. Thank you, Member Kim. Any other board members? Yes, Mr. Bodia. I just wanted to uh, check in with Member Harabidian to see if I addressed his question as well in terms of, I believe you're inquiring about distance education or remote education. Uh, yeah, no, I think you did. I, I think it was really helpful. I, it's more, I think it was just more like clarifying that independent or home study. Uh, I'm correct that we mean distance learning. It's not something correct. different. Correct. Yes, and it's uh, the way our regulations are currently that it's more for any non clinic non practical uh, approach. So technically theory applies here, right? If you're reading and you're doing case studies, even uh, as the pandemic showed, you can meet with other practitioners and do case studies. However, you have to go through the application process. But if it's anything like I believe uh, President Mateki was uh, addressing, if it's anything about 
actually practicing the needling or practicing a technique that needs to be in person um, because there is no comparison for that. There's no replacement for that. Agreed. Yeah, no, so thank you. You, you answered my question. Thank you, Member Harbidin. Yeah, thank you. I, I think this is a great, great discussion. Uh, I, you know, definitely support uh, for the board, uh, Mr. Bodia, for you and your staff to look into it. Uh, you know, the because with acupuncture as more and more being uh, integrated to the hospital facilities, you know, open it to the public, especially Medicare is covering for chronic low back pain. Uh, this is just the beginning for acupuncture being well accepted. I personally, I have seen many of the health insurance has changed and also start covering. And I would really, um, you know, from the consumer side, I think with our continued education, uh, would like to spell out, you know, how many units is a uh, in-person training um, because it's just the uniqueness of the technique, right? Um, I'm not sure with the surgeons, they, you know, can just learn everything distantly, doesn't have to be, uh, you know, in-person. I'm not sure how that worked, uh, but uh, I would like uh, to know from our board uh, to look into in-person training, uh, continued education versus, you know, distance training. Uh, how many units, maybe, you know, uh, for, for a practitioner pr practice for so many years is a conf comfortable. Uh, so maybe how many units is required, you know, hands-on. Um, uh, so uh, also I would, you know, see how our CEU, our continued education worked and integrated with others, uh, especially on the medical board, physician side, if they are doing acupuncture uh, practice, uh, how many units uh, they would accept it for our continued education. That would help physician too. They love, uh, you know, acupuncture. Uh, the lectures was put it on by acupuncturist. They feel very authentic in a way. I'm not trying to say medical acupuncture. They do get a great training, but they like to look what we are doing, join our conference. Um, so instead, I, it will be great. This is, can be the project for the board. Uh, that's my uh, proposal. And any other board members, uh, please feel free if you want to add. Yeah, I, uh, this is member Kim and I, Definitely agree agree with your uh, proposal, and uh, I I also uh, want to add that uh, uh, if uh, the association is represented by this uh, current practitioner, not just a license holder, you know, and then we can get some uh, comments or even from the subject matter experts that we can we can uh, uh, limit the number of. Uh, 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 in person and hands on training sessions per uh, you know courses because I've seen that uh, last, like two years back I when I was uh, teaching in some some uh, school there was a very pro prominent uh, 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 acupuncturist from China came and they they advertised that, that this is a hands on training live you know uh, treatment and there were about almost 200 people in the same room and you can't get a hands-on training the, the number but of course you you know if there's a limitation then you can invite such a, a very prominent uh, uh, acupuncturist doctor but uh, in in here in California I believe there are very qualified acupuncturists who can teach hands-on training sessions in, in with a limited number of uh, licenses they can benefit and then they can in, those benefits can be you know, you know hands down to the patients that they, they take care so maybe that's something that i want to also add on to this proposal thank you member kim so mr bodia <laughs> 
there's a lot of work ahead of you and your staff uh, work with stakeholders, schools, education, and the board members will, uh, we will help and uh, do as much as we can, but you have a lot on your shoulder. Thank you for waiting to uh, take this project. Certainly, Madam yeah. President. And uh, just to uh, speak to members Har Member Harbidian's point further, uh, a number of the other boards don't use our terminology uh, for distance education. They, they are a bit more specific. And I think that uh, it's prudent to point out here that when looking at uh, addressing our regulations on continuing education, um, we should look at aligning our terminology so that, as Member Kim mentioned, this is hands-on training. Um, uh, if you take a look at the summary for the Naturopathic Medicine Committee, fifth bullet down, it reads maximum 15 hours may be in naturopathic medical journals, osteopathic or allopathic medical journals, or audio or videotape presentations, slides, program instruction. See, so they've really spelled it out as to what would qualify as distance learning. Um, in terms of our terminology of live, in-person, distance, it, we would benefit by uh, clarifying that. We can definitely um, dive deeper into it and bring it before the board. No, thank, thank you. you. That was my sense. That's what I, I figured that was the case. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Tarabini, and thank you, Mr. Bodia. So it's a 1036. Board members, would you guys want to have a break a few minutes? Oh, I'm okay. okay, Dr. Mateki, I'm okay pushing forward if, um, I, I guess, what's the next item, uh, do we have a sense of how long it will be? I mean, obviously, if it's going to be a very long conversation, then we can take a break. But if it's not, you know, it's really up to the rest of the board members. But I'm okay at the moment. Uh, Madam President, this is Fred Chan, UDCA Legal. Um, yes. We do public comments before, uh, you know, going on any break. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yes, if uh, board members have no further comments, I'd like to open up to the public. DCA moderator, could you please facilitate? And thank you. Thank you, Legal. This is the moderator, and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen. And it looks like we do have one individual who has requested public comment, uh, Michael Fox. Michael, you'll be given three minutes to speak in a 30-second warning. I'm unmuting your microphone now. Thank you, moderator. This is Michael Fox I'm representing uh, Cal Apma, California Acupuncture and Traditional Medicine Association. I'm going to try to squeeze in three issues here. Uh, I would love to echo the support by Drs. Mateki and Chen and Kim regarding this idea of reciprocal, um, reciprocal CEUs. As acupuncturists become more and more integrated in hospitals and medical facilities, we are talking more and more with oncologists and endocrinologists and other specialists. We need to be educated in how to communicate with them. I think five hours is too little. I think that the whole 25 hours of distance education should be opened up for us to look at um, an automatic approval. If the AMA approves it and the CMA approves it and the nursing practitioners approves it, it would save, I think, our board a lot of time is by just saying uh, the acupuncturist will accept those. I would also like to add in anything accepted by the NCCAOM as uh, CEU providers uh, uh, as credits should be considered n nearly as automatic by the acupuncture board. The second issue is I would love to see if it would be possible for the acupuncture board to consider as other health healing arts boards have considered that we waive the initial CE requirements for initial licenses. That is, the students coming out of school can uh, waive their initial period CEUs. That's a calculation that gets a little onerous. I know we've all been doing it for many years, but honestly, if other boards are doing it, can we not just give them those first 18 and a half months of, of grace to um, 
begin their CEUs until they renew their initial license for the first time. And the last item I would like to bring up is uh, the time required to, to approve CEU provider courses um, is specifically when classes are exactly the same as they have been already approved before. So, ex so a repeated class, for example, and the only change would be either a date change or a language change. 30 seconds. Uh, I would love to see for the time of approval to be reduced from the current 45 days to the current to a new 30 days as would be uh, as the chiropractic board does, for example. Thank you very much. All right, this is a moderator. We'll move on to our next individual who has requested public comment. Individual identified as Adam White. Adam, you'll be given three minutes to speak in a 30 second warning. I'm unmuting your microphone now. Uh, this is the moderator. Adam, you are unmuted. Uh, this is the moderator again. Adam, if you are currently speaking, unfortunately, we cannot hear you. Um, you may want to try uh, toggling your microphone settings or connecting your um, audio through your phone. Thank you, co-moderator. Our co-moderator has put up um, instructions on the screen on how to do that. Um, in the meantime, um, we'll give you just a moment to see if your audio can get reconnected so you can make your comment. Uh, all right, this is the moderator. In the meantime, while we're waiting for um, Adam um, to resolve uh, his audio issues, uh, we'll move on to our next individual who has requested public comment, individual identified as Ron Zaidman. Ron, you'll be given three minutes to speak in a 30 second warning. I'm unmuting your microphone now. Yes, this is uh, Ron Zaidman from uh, Five Branches University. Uh, I just want to say that when we have very good uh, teachers uh, teaching uh, to, to large crowds, as was mentioned earlier, we, we are using uh, cameras to uh, do close-up observation of acupuncture technique. And even if it's distance education, the benefit to the practitioners is enormous. and. Uh, is is actually uh, sometimes more significant than being in person when the room is too crowded. So uh, just to understand that the value of, of distance education, being able to see the faculty member at close and also to see their acupuncture technique close by. Uh, again, this is not, <clears throat> this is observation. It's not uh, training of how to do acupuncture. So just to say that the, the distance education can be of great value to practitioners. Thank you. All right, this is the moderator. Um, we'll circle back with uh, Adam White and hopefully his microphone is working. Um, Adam, you'll be given three minutes to speak in a 30 second warning. I am unmuting your microphone now. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Oh, thank you, so I apologize for the delay. Thank you, Ron, too. I was lucky enough to be director of continuing education almost 30 years ago at Five Branches, and we hosted luminaries like Xiao Hua Li, Ming Qing Zhu, Guo Rang Zhu. What I find is the pedagogy of any individual course is what's ultimately important, not the delivery system, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's written uh, with exams, uh, live, in person, hands on, because Again, uh, 50 people crowding around one grandmaster and holding up iPhones overhead. Maybe they can see it, maybe they can't. It's difficult. What's important is the actual pedagogy of the course itself, the learning process, what they can take away from it. So it really is an individual course by course basis. The delivery system is, uh, is just one way of getting it to the people. It's not as important as 
reviewing the individual course material and the quality therein, regardless of the delivery mechanism. That's all I really wanted to say because we're focusing on delivery mechanisms, but again, uh, what do they take away? How many people can learn setting the mountain on fire? I, I, I know very few acupuncturists who know that technique. I'm not really allowed to provide that in distance learning education due to regulations in various states because they want hands-on. And yet I've taught it hands-on with some luminaries in the field and it just doesn't work. It would be much easier to do a video presentation to help them get it. And so things like penetrating uh, heaven's coolness, setting the mountain on fire, uh, different uh, dragon and tiger techniques with the needles, uh, metallurgy of needles and different needle styles. Some of this is actually better suited to distance learning than it is in person at times. So again, I just want to focus on pedagogy and I, I appreciate this discussion. And I, that's kind of what I wanted to say, uh, given my experience uh, three decades uh, in teaching people, the importance is uh, that they can learn these Chinese medicine techniques, that they can be solid in their fundamental theories of Wen Bing or Shan Han Lun. Um, I am concerned we're over medicalizing it and going a little too much. How to communicate with Western doctors is important. That is the job of the acupuncture colleges. And we do provide a lot of that, but ultimately I really want to see Chinese medicine and uh, the traditional medicine being focused on because there's so many seconds. people need to learn. Um, so I really hope that we continue to focus on acupuncture and herbal medicine and Twina as uh, very important goals. Thank you so much. All right, this is the moderator and it appears that was our last individual who has requested public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. All right, the Q&A feature is now closed. Okay, thank you. Uh, if a board member is okay, um, I will take Mr. Harabedin's suggestion. We will just uh, continue on. Uh, we don't have too much agenda item left. So uh, if Mr. Bodia, if you are okay, I will just continue, move on to agenda item number 23. Discussion and the possible action to initiate a rulemaking to amend the title 16. CCR 1399.411, application process criteria and procedures for approval of a credential evaluation services. Ms. Brother, please. I can step here, Madam uh, President. Uh, this item uh, we are requesting to be tabled as we are engaged in a new process in the regulatory review. Um, and so when we were working with our regulatory attorneys on this package that we had intended to bring to you before, the process changed and the entire package was reevaluated as, as opposed to the specific item that we were bringing to their attention. And so we want to address uh, all their comments. Uh, and so therefore, we will not be presenting this at this meeting. We will be bringing it back to the board in August. So this matter uh, can close. Thank you. So we will table this item. And now coming to the agenda item number 24, election of the board officers. So I would like to say a few words here. It has been a great honor and a privilege to serve you as your president for the past four years. Special thanks to the vice president, Mr. Kinnaman Chen, board members, our legal counsel, board staff, the members of the public, and our stakeholders for all your support for me. I would like to thank the leadership of the Department of Consumer Affairs. Also, I greatly appreciate all the support and the trust from the governor's office. Finally, I want to especially thank our board executive officer, Mr. Ben Bodia, for all your patience, diligence, and the flexibility to support me for the past four years. So I, it is a, a uh, hard decision, but uh, I decided not to continue running uh, for 
president or vice president. Uh, I greatly appreciated everyone, as I stated early. Um, so for election of, for the president, I would like to nominate uh, Mr. John Herbiding, who is current the chair for our education and the research committee. So Mr. John Herbiding, you have my vote uh, for the president for the uh, Acu uh, California Acupuncture Board. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mateki. Uh, let me just say that uh, I've I've strenuously um, tried to keep Dr. Mateki as our president. I really think that everyone can agree that she's been uh, a wonderful president, and with her at the helm, I think it benefits everyone. But I think four years four years has been a long time, and I do think she deserves a break. I I truthfully, I first of all apologize for not being with you yesterday because of a work conflict and as many of you know you know juggling the board uh and life generally with work and family is very you know it's very time consuming for all of us and so we all we all do what we can and uh i i do think that with the sunset review coming up uh i i am i am willing to to be president to help steward this process through and support staff in doing that, uh, if I can, on I guess two conditions: one, that uh, that the other board members aren't going anywhere, and that we can keep this team together, and uh, and two, that I can actually get my paperwork in for uh, for for reappointment. I um, I think a few of us are still waiting on uh, the governor's office to give us the paperwork. I don't think I have it yet, but that may be my that frankly may be my fault. Uh, because I've missed something. So um, I'm honored to even be nominated by Dr. Mateki and to be considered. I'm happy with someone else being president if that's the the right course, but I'm willing to do it uh, under those two caveats. If uh, if if somehow uh, a few of our board members are planning on stepping off, uh, it would make me a little bit hesitant because I do think that we have a critical mass of experience now on the board where I think going into sunset review, uh, I think it's going to be critical. So I'll say that and uh, thank you, Dr. Mateki, obviously for your service and for everything you've done. I think it's been you know, quite an extraordinary effort that you have put in. And I think the public and our stakeholders would agree and have noted it. And I'm happy to take the baton from you. I don't think, uh, I, I don't know, but I don't know if I could do four years, but uh, I can do something. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Herbeating. So Mr. Bodia, would you like to have facilitated this process? If you don't mind, I may ask you, please. Certainly, Madam President. Uh, so as it stands now, we are in the election for president process and we have uh, we are taking nominations for president. We have one nomination on the floor for member Herbidian and member Harbidian has accepted uh, with caveats. And um, we'll treat that as an acceptance, Mr. Her member Harbidian. Um, do we have other nominations on the floor from any other member? I am not hearing any other comments coming in and I do not see any hands raised in the Panel. As such, that will close the nominating circle. Um, let's go ahead and see. Do we need to provide public comment for all uh, nominations? Yes, let's go do public comment for nomination of Member Harbidian, please. Moderator. All right, this is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. And it looks like we do have one individual's requested public comment, uh, Michael Fox. Michael, you'll be given three minutes to speak and a 30 second warning. I am unmuting your microphone now. Thank you, moderator. This is Dr. Michael Fox of Calatma. And I want to reiterate the board's thanks and, and many thanks to Dr. Mateki for helming uh, an excellent acupuncture board for the last four years. 
And we would like to support the nomination of John Arabedian for president. There has not been a nomination for vice president, and um, maybe that's coming next in the agenda. But we feel like this acupuncture board has been very proactive and very protective of the public and in many ways in in many ways that uh, there's been robust discussion and Dr. Matecki and Mr. Harabedian and all of the board members have facilitated that quite well. So we would, we would like to again thank Dr. Matecki for her service and endorse Mr. Harabedian's candidacy for president. Thank you. All right, this is the moderator and our next individual is requested public comment is individual identified as Ron Zaidman. Ron, you'll be given three minutes to speak in a 30 second warning. I'm unmuting your microphone now. Uh, this is Ron uh, Zaidman from Five Branches University. Um, I want to repeat what others have said to thank uh, Dr. Amy Matecki for her leadership and the whole board. Um, I've had the privilege of coming to board meetings for uh, about 30 years. <laughs> and uh, these last four years uh, have made us very proud of the acupuncture board that we have here in California. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Matecki. We will miss you. <laughs> uh, and we thank you deeply. And we are confident that the board will continue with the new leadership in a very successful way. Thank you. All right, this is the moderator and it appears that was our last individual who has requested public comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. All right, the um, Q&A panel is now closed. Thank you. Uh, apologies, members. I did skip a step. Um, I need to request seconds for if any member will second member Harabidian's nomination. I second your opinion. I'm hearing a number of uh, seconds, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, put Dr. Chen is that. I heard Mr. Osorio as well, member Osorio. Um, so now... Okay, Ms. Osorio, uh, go ahead, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let the record reflect that. Um, and because of that jump, we have to go back to uh, the procedural aspect of asking for public comment again, if there is no issues. Uh, thank you. We'll keep that open for a little bit, see if there's any other questions or any public comment. All right, uh, this is the moderator. I have once again opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Um, if any members of the public would like to make a public comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. Um, and I will pause for a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel. All right, it appears there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. All right. Thank you so much, legal counsel. Um, being that there's only one member, are we required to hold a vote at this moment as well? Yes, we are. Thank you. Um, Mr. Brugman, if you could please do a roll call vote. The motion on the floor is to have Member Harabidian be the board president. Absolutely. Um, when I call your name, please indicate whether you are voting uh, yes, no, or if you are abstaining from the vote. Uh, Dr. Matecki. Yes. Kitman Chan. Yes. Yongping Chen. Yes. John Harabidian. Yes. Francisco Kim. Yes. Xu Dong Li. Yes. Ruben Osorio. Yes. So I show the vote as seven in favor, none okay, opposed. Okay, so you won the social security number, right? And uh, congratulations, Mr. Harabedian. You have been elected president. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and the FID is the number. It's not the fact that it's just Does someone, want, someone maybe can manually mute Ruben? 
Thank you, moderator. Congratulations, um, Robert Harvey. Huh? Yeah, so with, I think, technically, is Dr. Mateki finishing this this item out as president, or, or do you want me to assume chair now? Yeah, I congratulations. I <laughs> yeah. So I, I think we still you. have one more from Mr. Bodia. We need an election of the vice president. <laughs> congratulations, yeah. Mr. Rabining. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go ahead and run the uh, vice president election. And then after that, the virtual gavel can be passed to uh, incoming President Harabidian. And, uh, for, the, and for the record, uh, Ben, I, I, I'm delegating uh, chair of the meeting to Dr. Mateki through through the end. So she can, <laughs> she can remain. She can remain chair. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I'll move forward with uh, board members. Uh, do we have any nominations for vice president? Yeah, this is Kitman Chen. I nominate uh, Ruben Asoya as a vice president. Thank you, Member Chan, uh, Vice President Chan. Uh, Member Osorio, do you accept this nomination? I'll second it. Yes, I would. It'd be an honor to serve as Vice President. Thank you. Thank you so much, Member Osorio. We have a second from President Harabidian. Um, let's go ahead and ask for public comment. Oh, I'm sorry, any other nominations for Vice President from our board members? Hearing none. Let's go ahead and it uh, looks like we have one nomination that's been accepted for member Osorio to be vice president. Facilitator, if you could please open it up for public comment on this nomination. All right, this is the moderator um, and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, this is the moderator uh, seeing none. Oh, I apologize, someone uh, just jumped in, Michael Fox. Uh, Michael, you'll be given three minutes to speak in a 30 second warning. I am unmuting your microphone now. I just got in there. Thank you very much, moderator. Um, as this is Michael Fox as uh, Director of Communications for Cal Atma. I want to wholeheartedly endorse the candidacy of Mr. Osorio for vice president. I think he has served us well over the past several years, and I hope that the board would um, support his candidacy for vice president. Thank you. All right, uh, this is the moderator and appears there are no further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. All right, the Q&A panel is now closed. Thank you so much. Mr. Brueggemann, if you would kindly do a roll call vote for the vice president uh, position of member Osorio. Apologies. Um, as I call your name, please let me know if you're going to vote yes, no, or abstain. Dr. Mateki. Yes. Kitman Chan. Yes. Youngping Chen. Yes. John Harabedian. Yes. Francisco Kim. Yes. Shu Dong Li. Yes, sorry. I Thank you. Know. And uh, Ruben Osorio. Oh, yes. Uh, congratulations, Member Osorio. I show a motion passing with a 7-0 vote. Thank you so much, Mr. Brueggemann. And thank you, board members. Uh, we will, uh, per legal counsel's advice, uh, it aligns even with the uh, president future President Harabidian's uh, motion, but uh, 
Member Mateki is still president until she adjourns this meeting. And from there, uh, Member Harbidian will assume the presidency. So, Madam President, back to you for future agenda items. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bodia. And congratulations to our new president and vice president, um, Mr. Harbidian and Mr. Sorio. And thank you guys for willing to take on to continue to um, help this great board here. And we, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here to support. Uh, so now let's move on to agenda item number 25, future <laughs> agenda items. So any board members, uh, you like to see any of the future agenda items uh, to be put on the agenda. Uh, I want to open it up. I think earlier we have a lot of great discussions. Um, one part of with uh, continue education. Uh, so I would like uh, for the board uh, to put on the continue discussion and how uh, work with schools, uh, member of the public, stakeholders, uh, what's the best way for the continued education uh, unions, uh, how the future uh, is best to uh, serve the public and uh, protect the public. I open up here and uh, uh, any other board members want to have any uh, suggestion or comments, please. This item was on our agenda uh, yesterday as well, so the members may have uh, said their piece there as well. Okay. No further requests? Okay. So we will move to our final agenda, item 26, adjourn of the day two. Thank you, everyone, for your participation in today's meeting. Thank Point you. Order, to the Madam President, if we can open this up for the public comment. Yes, sorry, thank you. Moderator. Let's open up to the public. Moderator, please. Um, and just real quick, this is for future agenda items, correct? Yes. Okay, just wanted to double check. Um, this is the moderator um, at the direction of the board. I've opened up the uh, Q&A feature for public comment. Um, members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, uh, please click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, this is the moderator and it appears there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank okay. you. So we will move on to our final agenda, item 26, a journal of the day two. Thank you everyone for your participation in today's meeting. Thank you to the DCA moderator IT team for your assistance. Thanks to our executive officer and your staff, board members, and thank you so much for all your support and your hard work. Also, I want a special thank to our legal counsel. So our next board meeting is on August the 26th, 27th, and a congratulation to our new board president, Mr. Harbeating, and the vice president, Mr. Osorio. And I look forward to see you all in August 26, 27. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned at 11.09 a.m. Thank you. All right, this is.